Hey, Pete from Grepbeat here. This season of Exit Stories is brought to you by our friends at Dual Boot Partners. If you're looking for anything from a strategy session on your tech development plan to someone to build your entire tech offering from soup to nuts, then look no further than Dual Boot. And you don't have to look far. Dual Boot's headquarters are in Charlotte, but it opened a Raleigh office this year. Tell them Grepbeat sent you, and hopefully they won't hold it against you. We're here at Exit Stories, where we're talking to local leaders about their path to an exit. I'm your host, Kevin Mosley. Joining us today, we have a founder who started a few companies with his brother while still in school at NC State before graduating and starting StatusPage.io, a real-time status communication platform that was incubated in Y Combinator. They were growing quickly, adding thousands of customers over three years and ultimately were bought in 2016 by one of their customers, a very recently public Atlassian. Of course, I'm talking about Steve Klein. Steve, welcome to Exit Stories. Thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So give me the two minute background on statuspage.io. What did they do? You know, how did you start it? How did you get into this whole thing? Yeah. Yeah. So status page is a way for web companies to communicate with their customers when they're having downtime. So today, a bunch of companies, like Dropbox, Intercom, Pendo, GitHub. Uh, so they all use status page as kind of like their hub that customers can go to to see what's going on when they're having an outage or maybe some major features having a bug. Great. Um, yeah. How do we get into it? Okay. So kind of, kind of a long story. Um, so way back in the day, we, so me and my co-founder, who's also my brother, Scott, yeah. um, we were working at a local Durham company called Reverb Nation. Um, we had this idea for this, uh, long story short, Reverb Nation does like marketing tools for bands. Uh, we had this idea for this feature that would basically needed some way for like, um, fans at a show to like text message something to like vote on a song that a band would play. Um, so we like take this idea to a PM, um, and we're like, oh yeah, you know, we could do all this cool stuff. We'll use this new company yeah. called Twilio. It's like back in the day, we use this new company Twilio to like do oh, all the yeah, back end sure. SMS stuff. Um, uh, and his response at the time was like, ooh, yeah, I don't know. If, I don't know if we could like build this whole big feature that's like powered by this little Twilio company. Like, I don't know who these guys are. Uh, <laughs> and it, I think it kind of planted this idea in our head around like, man, companies need a better way to like put, uh, like a, a better way to like show like, hey, you know, we are reliable. We take this stuff seriously. We, we are open and transparent about our outages. We like publish this kind of stuff. Um, I think they kind of like planted this idea in our head of like, there's a, there's a better way for, for this to happen. Um, so fast forward a couple of years, um, we both, uh, both left Reverb Nation and we were doing, uh, consulting. So we were just building websites for some people in the area. Uh, and our plan at the time was we wanted to build a few just like small B2B SaaS apps that could hopefully throw off a little bit of passive revenue. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember thinking at the time, like, oh man, if like in a few years, this thing could get to like 5,000 MRR, we would be set. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like 22 at the time. And I'm thinking like, man, cool. We like split 5,000 a month. That's 2,500 bucks a month. That's like a 40% raise for me. So I'm like, oh, this is, <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna have it made at, at like 5k MR. Um, so we're so we're doing the consulting thing and we're kind of like looking around for ideas. Um, and we so at the time we see that um, GitHub and Heroku had made their own version of this this thing that we had like um, that we like needed Twilio to have back in the day. They they built like their own custom yeah. status page that they had hosted. And I think it's just from like being like we're working in tech and like using SaaS apps a lot. And just like, I, I think we just had this intuitive sense that like, if there were an easy way for all SaaS companies to have something like this, it, it would be, it'd be a no brainer. Um, it's an, like having outages can be a nightmare. You just get like flooded with support tickets or there's no like good, you like, I, I think the state of the art back in the day was like, Oh, people just like tweeted about the downtime they're having, which is like not, Great. We just thought, um, like, of course, there's uh, room for like a purpose-built tool sure. around this thing. 
Um, yeah, and that was that was the kind of birth of Status Page. It was the first like um, first of like many SaaS apps that we like planned to build, and it just kind of took off uh, pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, it was, it was good. Well, nice. So, so you started this just with your brother. Was it just the two of you as co-founders? Was there anybody else involved? Yeah, in the beginning. So, like for the, the I mean, by beginning, I mean like first four months. So, like we yeah. we built the MVP and um, got our first few customers um, and got into Y Combinator pretty early. Um, and we were looking, kind of looking to bring on someone else at the time to like run sales a bit more. Um, and we got introduced to a guy, Danny Olinsky, um, from, uh, Scott had mainly just kind of known him through like the Durham startup networking scene. Um, so Danny came on and thank God he did because he's the clutchest. Um, uh, he came on right before Y Combinator. Like the first time I ever actually met him in person was he, I forget, is he, I think he picked me up from the airport. Um, in at SFO. Uh, yeah. And the rest is history. Very nice. So, so Scott, or so Scott, your brother, was he CEO? I think you were COO, right? And then, uh, and then this guy was the sales guy, right? Yeah. Danny. Scott, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So Scott was, Scott was CEO. He was, he was also like our dev lead for, for okay. the longest time. Um, Danny, so interesting. Danny had like recently done like a code bootcamp thing in okay. New York. So he was going to kind of like, do the original plan was he was going to do a little bit of like code stuff um, and and also sales um, and did that for a few months and then just kind of transitioned into mostly doing sales. Um, yeah. And so Scott was like dev lead CEO. Um, Danny's doing sales. I was doing kind of uh, all of our front end design and development, a lot of early marketing stuff. When you're, you know, it's small. It's like everyone's kind of doing a little bit of everything. So we're like figuring out, you know, how to like build a build a support team, uh, like all of our early content marketing stuff. Um, so a little a little bit of everything. Yeah, and I always found it interesting. You had, you and I had talked before about. I think you taught yourself UI. Um, you had a marketing degree, right, coming out of NC State. So yeah, really yeah. Uh, awesome to be able to eventually do that for for a living and to start something off that. Yeah, it's incredible. It's uh, if if you have like the time and the drive, like there's no reason pretty much anyone can't like learn how to do really some like minimal like front end development stuff. Um, so I was um, very fortunate to have done that because I think it paid off uh, significantly in the in the long run. So nice. And you and your brother had started some other things, random <clears throat> things, kind of back in college too, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's when I learned how to do learn how to do front end uh, dev and design stuff. So we, so this is how we ended up at that company, Reverb Nation. So we uh, built. So we started this company that made it was a way for bands to like build their own iPhone app. Okay. So iPhone was like you know kind of blowing up at the time. Uh, so bands basically bands would like come to the website, they'd sign up, they'd upload like their songs and their show schedule and blah blah blah. Uh, and our tool would create a individual iPhone app for that band. Okay, so, so Sound Around got acquired by Reverb Nation. Well, cool. So then getting back to status page, um, so you guys started this up, you went through Y Combinator. What's that process like, like getting through there? Are you just you know inundated with funding requests after that? We, um, so we honestly, we kind of like limped into funding after that. I don't know that we had like a... Um, uh, to be honest, like we didn't have this like clear idea of like this whole hu like huge vision like for all of all of the things that status page like uh, would go on to become. So we kind right. of it was like a little bit like we it was kind of just like our ethos that we wanted to like grow a bit more like slowly and profitably like off the backs of customers as opposed to just like hey let's raise not know exactly what we're even going to do with it and like try and build a rocket ship and see what happens. Um, so, so we raised, um, so we got a, a hundred K through YC. Um, and then we raised like around a hundred grand after that. Um, but yeah, definitely didn't, um, weren't doing any of like the big, it's funny now, like I, I try to angel invest a little bit in some of like the recent, like the YC companies now, 
and their like pre seeds are like a million or two million dollars. And sure. like, oh, but that definitely like wasn't on our radar at the time. Um, yeah. Uh, gotcha. Yeah, was good. Yeah, it was, it was uh, like overall it was extremely valuable. Like just being around um, so many other smart people that are doing really cool things is just incredibly motivating. And the partners are great, and you you get access to this like incredible uh, alumni network and all of the even just like uh, by like virtue of like being a YC company, it, like you get this sense of um, it like imbue some like trust and like likability onto you. Um, so overall, it was an incredible experience. Got it. And so, you know, coming out of that, so you guys only take, you know, you only end up getting, you know, about 200K or so of funding. So essentially beyond that, you guys are, are you profitable around that time? Are you profitable all the way moving forward then? Yeah. I mean, honestly, by the, we were paying ourselves like pretty shit salaries, like while sure. we're still in YK, but, or in YC. Um, uh, I mean, we were doing like 10 to 15K MRR by the end of YC. And we were like, we were like ramen profitable. We were like, we were probably like paying ourselves, I don't know, like 50, 60 K each. Sure. Um, and then like we were able to like scale up salaries a little bit as we grew. Um, and then just kind of like long term, our general, um, like a general benchmark we had was like, Hey, we want to have in the range of like 200 K ARR per like new employee that we bring on yeah. just kind of as, as a way to make sure that we're, and still just like still profitable and like staying like kind of lean, right? Got it. So then, you know, it's not too long then after that, after that story that you guys eventually then end up getting acquired. So tell me a little bit about the story in between. So you guys are, you guys are profitable. Um, how, how's growth rate going around that time? Are you kind of exploding? Are you on that rocket ship path? Yeah, growth, growth is good for a long time. So like, especially right after when you're small, it's as like, it's very easy to grow like large sure, sure. percentages month over month. So like, you know, but the end of YC, we're like, we're growing 40% month over month and then it's 30% month over month. And da, da, da. and I think it like leveled ish out around maybe uh, around 10%. So we were, um, we were definitely, no, well, that's not true. It probably leveled out closer to like five. Um, but even like, by the so time at, we were, five, at 5% a month. So, you know, around, you know, so like, we're still talking doubling or so every year at least, right? Yeah, it was probably, yeah, we're probably like a little bit less than doubling. Okay. For, and also it was like only like three or four years, like the whole like sure. life of the company before we were acquired. Um, so yeah, in the range of like doubling or a little bit less every year. So pretty good, like a reasonable, I think it's like a reasonable clip to be growing at. Um, Got yeah. It. Okay. What else was going on in between? Um, okay. So we, so we did YC. So we we're all co-located, um, in Mountain View. And then, um, so afterwards, Danny, Danny stayed in San Francisco. I came back to North Carolina. Scott, um, ended up in Fort Collins. His, what's the story? His girlfriend at the time was getting her, her masters in Fort Collins, Colorado. Okay. Um, so we do the remote thing for a little bit and we're, trying to keep it that way um we part of it was we were just like struggling to hire here and i don't know that any of us were like really like really liking the remote um the remote setup so we ended up kind of uh settling on having offices in san francisco and denver um so i, I moved out to denver for a year before the acquisition happened okay uh which was really cool um yeah what all went on um Nothing crazy. Like we just kind of like grew. Like we grew at a pretty steady clip. We got up to thirteen people before we were acquired. Um, yeah, I mean, pretty much just like. What was the uh, what was the ARR at that point? Like the time that you guys were about to get acquired. Yeah, like right around the time it started, we were like right at three. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So you're three. You're profitable. You're you're kind of you're doubling or so every year. So let's yeah, let's walk into the the exit then. Um, so. You you eventually sell to Atlassian, right? And so Atlassian is one of your customers. Yeah, yeah. So they were, um, yeah, even one of our early customers is, is kind of a funny story. Like way way back in the day, um, Bitbucket had an outage, and we just got just trashed with traffic. And so all of Status Page goes down because we're like, 
you know, obviously some, of our, <laughs> some of our, so we were feeling like shit about ourselves. Like, man, if we can't even stay up and some of our customers go down, like, what's the point? Um, so that was, that was kind of a funny thing, but, but yeah. Um, so like Bitbucket and hip chat were definitely like using status page. Um, and we had, we had integrations with hip chat, which is honestly like part of the, part of the thing that ended up kicking off talks around um the acquisition like the the bd guys are kind of in talks with the ma guy MA guys so you know integrations that you do with the company there's always like kind of the possibility like hey maybe this is actually a good acquisition target um so that was like one of our like early introductions into those kind of talks in the first place um yeah gotcha and were you thinking about i mean had you guys always kind of planned on this is about that time three to four years in that you wanted to sell or you know in the year or so leading up to that point had you had a lot of discussions about that we so we had been thinking about it um i don't know that we like started like to some degree like i don't know i think most people start startups with the intention of having an exit at some point sure. yeah um we uh, I don't know how much of this is like getting into the weeds, but it, so at the time we were thinking strategically that, um, like that status pages might not always exist as like a category in itself and might, might end up being like a feature of it's like bigger neighboring, um, categories. So like monitoring tools or like even customer support tools, like status pages will, I think, and we definitely thought then will like ultimately become a feature of those things. Um, so we were thinking, Hey, we, we need to like, maybe we like go raise money and like launch, launch a preemptive strike into some of these things into like some of these bigger neighboring areas. Mm, gotcha. Um, or we get it, or we get acquired by a company that, um, like already has a story they're building around that and we can become kind of a part of that bigger story for them. Um, so we were, it was definitely like on our radar that, you know, this, this is something we need to be thinking about, talking about. Um, and I think from Atlassian side, they were, they were starting to think a lot more about their, uh, incident management story. So they kind of had the, you know, all the early parts of building product. So they had like confluence for like planning out what products are, are going to be, um, Jira for like, you know, doing like the sprint planning and did this all of like the actual building it. Um, and strategically they're thinking about, okay, now the next piece is like all of the things around running products and services. Sure. Um, part of that is, you know, inevitably all things are going to have some downtime. So you need like a way to manage those incidents. Um, so they ended up obviously acquiring us, um, and would go on to acquire Ops Genie. Um, yeah, they, I think for a little bit, they tried building like, um, flavor of jira called jira ops which uh, they ended up just like putting all of their weight behind ops genie which is another company they acquired um yeah so that's awesome and great to have you know the strategic story within there tell me about the the process of getting you know getting acquired so how did they how did they approach you guys how did the you know the term sheet process go was it super quick or long and drawn out yeah um it, Probably more, probably closer to like long and drawn. I don't have a lot of context <laughs> on like what other deals like for us. It felt like, oh God, it was, yeah. um, it was like How four months. It? Okay. Yeah. Probably four months from talks to, from talking, like starting talks to close. But it, it felt like forever. Uh, like they're, so they're a public company and like we, we couldn't talk about it with friends or with anyone really. Um, and if you do, like they just kind of have to like, if like we're, Credible word gets out that like, hey, there might be an acquisition happening here. I think they like maybe have to kind of just bail on it for like Probably. insider, yeah, something like that. So I didn't remember like the day that it closed, um, being like texting the TechCrunch article to a bunch of friends because it's like, oh man, I finally like get to tell all these people about uh, this cool thing. Uh, so it's kind of funny. Nice. Um, yeah, so it kind of starts. There's almost like two different like periods of diligence. There's like the there's like the pre pre like term sheet thing, which is where you're like, you want to, you want to kind of paint this picture of like, we're here's where our numbers are at. Like here's, how, here's like how we're growing, but like, you don't want to turn in, turn it into this like spreadsheet exercise. You want it, you want the earlier side to be more of like a, 
strategically, here's why, you know, numbers aside, like we're yeah. much more important than that, right? So you, tr you try and like finesse that picture. Um, and then, uh, and then you kind of get on the same page and you have like a, like a preliminary, like term sheet or letter of intent or whatever. Um, and then, and then the diligence is like, oh man, it's, you know, s just super in depth. Like here's all of our, every payment we've ever received. Here's like every contract we've ever signed. Here's, you know, just like fully, uh, uh, every, you know, every single one of our customers, what features each of them are using, you know, kind of, so we had this big, you know, you have this kind of big war room where you're just like dumping a bunch of data for their like lawyers and analytics people to go through and just kind of verify that things are on the up and up. Um, I think luckily, honestly, luckily as part of like doing YC, they, they like definitely help you to get things uh, from just like a corporate governance stance kicked off in a good way. So, all, you know, we were like a Delaware C Corp and, you know, all, all of those things that just make that process easier. We're already kind of buttoned up from the beginning. So that was nice. Um, yeah, how was the yeah. uh, how is it getting acquired, you know, by a public company? Uh, how is that, you know, not that you have, you know, maybe any uh, well, you went through the reverb nation thing. So, you know, you've got the private side and you go to this this public side. What's the what's the difference there? Is it just, you know, whatever pressure multiplied by, you know, infinite amounts? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The I mean, the difference between the two is like astronomical. For the first one was like the reverb nation was buying this like toy we had built and the other one was like a, you know, a real thing. So, yeah. yeah, got it. So, and you know, around that time, I don't know how how much of this you can share or or not. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, given you know, Atlassian is a public company, but how much did it end up selling for? Yeah. So the fur. Um, so I think about it in two ways. So like the value of like the deal at the time was um, like a little more than thirty. Okay. Um, so obviously part of that was stock. So, uh, the majority of it was cash, but there was a good portion that was stock. Um, and they're just kind of the way it works out. So let's just describe this. So the stock that all of us ended up getting, that number of shares was calculated by taking that like dollar amount of stock that we were going to get yep. and dividing by like the average of the stock price in the month that the deal closed. So then from there, as the stock price kind of, and, uh, it was like, um, uh, you invest, obviously you like, there's a one year cliff and you invest, uh, into it over a handful of years. Um, so, but as the stock price changes, like over that time, uh, you know, the, you get the number of shares was like pre-calculated. So if the stock yeah. price goes up, you, you know, you share in the benefit of that. Um, and like, I think today the stock price is like, seven times what it was it, it's in the, I, like, I was gonna say it's significantly it's, higher than it was um, i know and hopefully you guys still hold on to a, a pretty hefty amount of that yeah i wish i could say <laughs> that were the case so it's one of those like I don't know, i'm not like in the business of like picking stocks you know the the standard play is like you just kind of sell it as it best and diversify and it's the i don't know it's the right thing to do but definitely like kicking myself in the ass a little bit for it. So going into the going into the acquisition then, so you guys have taken a little bit of funding. Obviously you kind of the co-founders have the majority at that point. Is it, you know, is it pretty much everything in just the option pool? Yeah. Yeah. So I think the founders we own like eighty percent of the company okay. and employees had maybe ten percent and then founders had like the other ten percent. This you know you have this deal go through. Did everybody go through with you? Did every every one of the co-founders and all the you said it was like thirteen employees or so at the time? Did everybody come over? Yeah, I think the only one um, only one person didn't. Um, their um, just for like personal reasons and like their setup, he just needed to stay in Denver. Got it. Got it. Uh, and so did you guys? Did you guys have to move? Did you uh, have to like go into their offices and stuff? Okay. Yeah, yeah, we did. It was actually. Um, maybe like one of the most painful parts of the whole thing. Um, you know, so we had a handful of people that like lived in Denver. They're like lived there for a reason. They like loved being close to the mountains. Um, e even today, like obviously like cost of living is still like uh, significantly better in Denver. So um, there was definitely some friction there. Uh, I mean, so much so. Like we were a small team, we're only thirteen people. Sure. Most of our developers are in, we're in Denver, um, and you know if 
if two of them had bailed, then you know, that's like half the dev team at the time and like sure. could have tanked the deal. So we were like doing, doing like whatever we could to like say like, like this is going to be a good thing. And you know, I, I, honestly, I think we maybe like positioned it in like a bad way. I think some of them felt like we were coming to them telling them like, you need to do this because we know what's best for you. So I, I don't think we like massage the message the best way. Uh, and it almost like bit us to be honest. So there's definitely, there's definitely a little bit of heartache, but I think it, I think ultimately it turned out for the best. And, um, yeah. Did everyone at the company have options? Did everyone kind of make out pretty well from the exit? Yeah, I think everyone did pretty good. So we had a handful of people. So even for like status page, we had like a one year cliff, okay. um, for all that. And we, anyone that hadn't hit their one year cliff, we just auto accelerated to their one year cliff. Um, so everyone got, everyone got like a, reasonably good ch chunk of change from the acquisition um and then certainly especially as atlassian stock price climbed like they all got um i think most of the employees probably got more from the options just because they hadn't vest hadn't like vested their status page stuff as, as much um so certainly they all benefited like a lot from the stock price going up and i think they all got like pretty good stock packages to begin with so yeah. And so, you know, you mentioned, you know, you guys had to move through the, so is Atlassian in, is that in the Bay Area that you guys had to move? Yeah. Out to? Sorry. Okay. So they're in, so in San Francisco. So we moved, the whole team moved into the Atlassian offices. Got it. And so did you have like a contract with them of you had to stay for a certain amount of time or was it basically because of, you know, the stock that it was pretty obvious that you wanted to stay at least whatever it was one year, two years? Yeah. I don't think I was trying to think, like, I don't know if there was anything that, like any of us were required to stay for any amount of time. Right. It was just kind of like a generally understood, like, yeah, of course we're going to hang around. And we were, um, had stock packages to incentivize that as well. So, yeah. Got it. And so you, but you stuck around for a little while then afterwards, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I stayed for two and a half years afterwards. Um, so we actually left, um, out of all the, I left six months before the other founders. So okay. my wife was, so, Let's see. Uh, my last day was like the end of February, 2019. Okay. Um, my wife was due in the middle of April. So we were like, all right, we gotta, we gotta get the hell out of here and, uh, get back <laughs> home and get a house set up and everything. So I, yeah, I left a little bit early actually. So tell me a little bit about the transition into, you know, a public company. And, you know, that's, that's not an easy thing to do once, you know, if you get 13 employees, you move everybody from Denver to San Francisco, you know, you guys are, you guys know that you're going to be there for at least a year or two while you're, while, while some of these options vest, some of the stock vest, you know, tell me about the transition. How does, how does a company go and, you know, kind of switch from heavy startup mode to, you know, working for a public company? Yeah, it's tough. So we, we gave everyone like a good six months, like get moved over and everything. Um, but yeah, even just kind of like getting settled into a company is tough. So they have, they just have like so much, so like, and I have so many like internal programs and, um, like initiatives going on. Um, and they want, you know, they want you to be part of it. So we, at the beginning, we had kind of a ton of people reaching out. Um, uh, trying to get into into some of these things and we're you know we're still a small team there were 13 people with like four developers at the time so we end up having to like say no to a lot of stuff um and just like uh, it's the amount that, of like integration stuff that you do to like get right. into the company it's right. kind of it's kind of a double-edged sword like on one hand you want to you know you have all these ideas for like what what your roadmap is and is going to be and like you feel like you know what's best for your customers and so you want to you want to prioritize those things um but at the same time um the longer you like delay that integration um work it, it just makes it harder for you to it just makes it harder for you to like become like fully be absorbed and like feel like you're an atlassian and not like a status pager anymore um, and we, we definitely, I don't know, we, I don't know if aired is the right word. I don't know. It's kind of hard to you know, like in hindsight, what the right yeah, thing sure. to do is we yeah. definitely delayed integration stuff. Um, and I, and I think from just like culturally, it kind of impacted us. Like we definitely felt like outsiders for a while. Um, 
uh, which makes it, it, it just makes it hard. Um, and then, like another thing is like you have to, when you're getting acquired, like the M and A team kind of like helps you paint this picture of like what the, what, what like the strategic kind of vision is for you inside there. Sure. Um, but after that's over, you really have to like take it on yourself to like push on that. Make that um, happen. Yeah. And, and make that, ha- yeah. And make that happen. And by delaying some of like the integration work, it made it harder for us to, to like paint that picture or to like have a, you know, have a story for like good things that would get, you know, heavily funded or things like that. Um, yeah, that's so it's actually a really, it's a really interesting point about the M&A team, um, about how, you know, they, they have a job, which is to go out and acquire you and tell this great story. And they're talking to the various business units and saying, Hey, wouldn't it be great if, you know, if, if these guys were here and everybody's saying, yeah, sure, whatever. Um, and then they go and do it and you're right. And then they just kind of, they get through the early parts of the integration, they finish up the acquisition and then they, they kind of just let you go. So yeah. uh, that, that's something you don't, you don't always hear about that side of the story about how there's, uh, you know, it's more on the business that just got acquired almost to go make it happen um, and to go make the vision happen because you have these business people who, you know, they're happy to have you, but, you know, that's not their their driving function to make sure that you're integrated and taken care of. Right. Um, and maybe, yeah, I'm wondering if like maybe some, maybe like more coaching around that could have, could have helped us. So we were, you know, because we we're pretty young, didn't have, didn't have ex- like none of us had experience like working for bigger companies like that sure. just kind of um i think it would have helped to have hand holding is not the right word but like a little more uh, just a little more mentoring around like how to like better navigate that or better insert insert ourselves into the picture um that kind of thing so you know obviously looking back now on this entire process what a what an incredible journey what what do you wish that you had done differently or what do you wish that you had you'd known back then? Yeah. So first, uh, knowing what the, uh, Atlassian stock price would have done in the future. <laughs> would probably held on a little more. Um, but also I've been talking about this with some friends lately as I'm trying to kind of like get back into, yeah. get back into the tech scene. Uh, I, honestly, I think I kind of looked at my time at Atlassian almost more as like a, th- like as a thing to get through before I could get back to, you know, or like get to the next stage of my life instead of looking at it as an opportunity to like grow professionally and like foster relationships that, um, you know, that I would like hopefully could have gone on to benefit from. That sounds like a very like relationships are only for. No, no, I, I, I you know what I mean? But like the, you know, like the people that you work with, you end up, you know, working with again down the line. Um, and I wish I had invested more effort and energy into that, into those kinds of things. But yeah. All right. Well, you know, Steve, thank you again for you know joining me today, sharing your exit story. You know, you're back in the triangle. You're involved in the startup ecosystem. I know I'm so excited you're here. We're so excited that you're here. I'm looking forward to seeing all the things that you get involved in. Um, and truthfully, also, I can't wait until we're able to go out again and get some coffee, uh, which yeah. you know, that will be, but yeah, for sure. Well, I'm happy to be back and I'm definitely excited for the area here looking to like do, do a little bit of, uh, angel investing around here. Um, so yeah, should be good. Well then talk to Steve if you want some money, but otherwise, you know, <laughs> to, to, you, the, to you, the audience, you know, we, we hope you enjoyed the exit story. You know, join us again next time for more of them. Thanks again. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, Pete from Gretbeat here. Clearly you're a podcast aficionado, so here's another one for your list. On Pete Meets, I meet some of the most interesting people in the Triangle's tech startup scene to learn about the person behind the LinkedIn profile. It's like behind the music, but about tech, and nobody gets arrested or goes to rehab. Probably. So subscribe to Pete Meets. I'll meet you there.